Hi, my name is Alyssa Grenfell, and I am an ex-Mormon author and content creator, and today I wanted to tell the whole complete story of what it was like for me to grow up super ultra-Mormon, to leave the church, to break away from everything I really had ever known, and then to move on after that. Before I continue, of course, please make sure to like and subscribe, and if you are currently recovering from Mormon, I recommend reading my book, How to Leave the Mormon Church. I, I took about two years to write this, and it just got published. It has a foreword by John DeLynn, the host of Mormon Stories, and the Amazon reviews are awesome. So please consider getting a copy if you want to learn more about my story or if you're someone who is recovering from leaving the church. So many of memories of my childhood are in church, something called activity days, mutual, family home evening, morning prayer. I never really took the time to count how many hours I spent as an active Mormon just doing the Mormon thing. But at this point, I'm sure I have my 10,000 hours of mastery. And so I feel like I've basically mastered Mormonism, which is why I started this channel, is to share everything about it, everything I learned, uh, and also just to connect with other people who are interested in Mormonism. I think some of my earliest memories were feeling like, as a girl, I, I was kind of a tomboy. Uh, of all the Disney movies, I loved Mulan, where she goes off and fights in a war. And I think I was always just not quite the girly girl that is most valued in Mormonism. I remember more than once that as a young kid, I would be in a church activity and the girls would be doing something like sewing, making a meal, learning how to put together an outfit, how to run a home. And all of, all of the curriculum always seemed to be very much focused on how to be a good homemaker, even when I was eight. And at the same time, in the same church building, I'd see all the young men or the, the boys who were you know aging up into young men's, and they would be playing basketball or planning hikes or playing with fire and learning to build a fire. And it, it just always felt like I always wanted to be doing what the boys were doing because they often were actually doing fun things. They were not learning to do labor. They were not learning to uh, run a household or how to you know, be a better babysitter. They were playing basketball, they were hiking, that kind of a thing. I always felt jealous of what the boys got to do versus the girls and but at the same time, I felt like any time, and I'll share this again and again, likely in the story, any time my personality was separate from the Mormon value, I always shoved it so far down because it really felt like that was, you know, in Mormonism, they talk a lot about the natural man. The natural man is an enemy to God is a scripture in the Book of Mormon. And essentially, it's supposed to say, you know, any human based urge is kind of sinful is sinful and any urge towards godliness is holy and so you know growing up as a kid i've heard a lot of people comment on my videos and say especially women that when they s saw a lot of the sexism in the church that's what made them lose their testimony for me it was almost the opposite because when i saw sexism in the church when i was told my most important thing I would ever do is have to have children. And whenever I was told that, you know, cover your shoulders or you should be feel guilty for, you know, being a woman and existing in on the physical plane. I always took the opposite take, which was if I don't like that, they're saying that to me, I'm bad. I'm the sinful one because I, I never doubted that the authority that was over me within the church was correct and I was patently wrong. And it, it probably went back to that scripture and back to this idea that if I disagree, something in me disagrees with the church, I'm the, the one that's wrong. Certainly I'm the one that's wrong and God on high, the almighty, is the one that's right. And so when I'm feeling frustrated by this gender inequity, I see where girls are learning to take care of the home, boys get to go off and have fun, and then we bring the spaghetti that we just made to the boys in a, in a strange way of acting out us being mothers and caretakers and wives someday at eight. If I felt any sort of negative feeling towards that, I would feel even worse because I would feel like my desires and values were not aligned with God's. And I think that knee-jerk reaction 
kept me in the church for a very long time past when maybe a lot of people logically might have been like, I don't think God does value women less than men. I don't think God does want women to covenant with their husbands or, you know, any number of more many things I could name. Uh, I think a lot of women experienced that and said, that doesn't sit right with me. I want to be treated as an equal. I'm leaving. This is not an, an organization. This is not a religion for me. And I wish I had, I wish I had that sense of self, that logic. Cause I think a lot of people, if you're like me, when you see something you disagree with in the church, it just adds guilt or adds this weight upon you where you are basically interpreting that feeling as you being sinful. When I got baptized at eight, it was a very pivotal moment for me. And it's weird because I don't know if the average person remembers a lot of specifics from their childhood. Honestly, I, I, you know, I remember here and there, but I do remember my baptism day and the weeks or and the weeks following pretty well, very, especially the emotions very clearly. And the reason for that is, is that when you <clears throat> that when you turn seven, your family begins talking a lot about baptism, about how you're going to choose to be baptized. Spoiler warning, almost every eight-year-old chooses to be baptized because they want to just do what their parents say. And they've been trained to believe that the Mormon church is what they should be baptized in. But I had a lot of messaging about how once you turn eight, you're able to sin. And once, you're, once you can sin, your soul can be corrupted. And... I had so much anxiety around getting baptized because people would be constantly telling me that before you turn eight, you're perfect. And I even remember having younger sisters and feeling so jealous of them after I got baptized because all I could think about was how they're still perfect. Mormons believe that before you turn eight, your soul is literally perfect. And then once you're eight, you can sin. And so it was so terrifying to me, this idea that I basically, as soon as I turn eight, was going to fall down this mountain of sin <laughs> that I could never climb back up from. Um, because, and I think, you know, even though Mormons believe, you know, you can take the sacrament and that washes away your sins, nothing ever quite felt the same after baptism. I think even when I was eight and a half, if I would think a sinful thought and take the sacrament, I at least emotionally didn't feel like better in the same way that I had felt when everyone was telling me I was literally perfect and that I couldn't sin. You, they believe you literally can't sin. And so I feel like I got a lot of anxiety around my baptism. And I even asked my mom, I remember driving in the car and asking her, isn't it better essentially to die before you get baptized? Because if you die before you get baptized, you're, it's a sure thing. You're definitely going to heaven. But if you wait, and you go and you grow up past eight, you're risking going to, you know, Mormon hell. <laughs> you're risking getting covered in sin. And it just didn't seem worth the risk to me as an eight year old. And she said, you know, of course you can take the sacrament and, you know, no, God wants you to learn and grow. But it was like it, the, the logic never quite held with me because it always seemed better to just be perfect than to risk not being perfect. So I do feel like I kind of started to wish I was going to die around the time I was turning eight. Uh, it's like when I was from seven to eight, I would think about like, man, it'd be really nice if I could just die because then I would never have to be able to sin. I did have a lot of good moments in the church. I always loved girls camp, which is a all girl camp where you go and you go off into nature and it's a lot of female bonding. And I always found really good friends there. I did and I did honestly really love God and I loved Jesus and I loved the concept of the atonement and I found a lot of peace in that. But I also think looking back that I feel like often the guilt I was feeling about saying something mean or thinking a, a unkind thought or these very small things you do that are just part of being human, that I would feel such tremendous guilt about it and such overwhelming gra and such overwhelming gratitude at God for removing my sin. And in many ways, I think that the church kind of invented a lot of the psychological pain you feel and then gives you the antidote, which is prayer, scripture study, and Jesus. I don't know if I would have felt this huge, massive amount of guilt associated with an unkind thought if I hadn't had that guilt kind of put into me or suggested to me or told to me 
as a Mormon kid. When I was when I was 14 or 15, I had a member of the bishopric come into my class. It was all girls. And for whatever reason, he decided to talk about modesty that day. And I recall him saying that when you dress immodestly, which is like a tank top, short shorts, or even let your skirt ride up a little too high, that if a man or boy sees that, he will picture you naked. And I remember as he said it, he look he looked at everyone in the room and made the the very pointed eye contact that is so common in Mormonism. And I just felt so, I, I'm sure I turned red. I felt so embarrassed. And there's n literally no way that my parents would send me to church in anything other than the most modest clothing. And yet in that moment, I felt like, I felt like I was naked. I felt like I was totally vulnerable because this adult man in his 50s or 60s is describing that if he sees too much skin, he's going to picture you naked. And that is your fault as the woman. Uh, we're not doing the if thy nine offend thee, gouge it out. We are doing let's make 14 year old girls responsible for the thoughts and emotions and feelings of 60 year old men. But the, I use that as just an example of in that moment, I think a lot of people would say, oh, hell no, that's messed up. This is not the place for me to be. Instead, I heard that and I thought, I'm so ashamed of myself that I it's even possible for me to make other people sin like that. And I hate my body for existing because by my body's existence, I could accidentally lead someone into sin, which for most people is totally irrational. And that man was a creep. But for me, as a 14 year old who's been brainwashed and trained to believe authority over her own gut for so long, I went through that experience. And all I could think about was I am I'm a bad person. I'm sinful. My body is sinful and I'll do whatever it takes to cover even more of my skin so that I never offend God and I never lead anyone into temptation. Now, of course, I look back at that story and I think, why didn't the young women's leaders say anything if if a man said that to a teenage girl in my presence i would say you need to step into the hall let's talk you can't come in here anymore actually if you're gonna say shit like that <laughs> but you know no banana for me having anyone stick up for me <laughs> i also had an experience in middle school which was fairly foundational because I moved to Texas from Montana. I grew up in, in Montana until I was about nine, and then we moved to Texas. And when we moved to Texas, I tried to make friends with these Mormon girls that were in my stake, which a stake is like a collection of many um, wards. Like maybe picture five to six to seven congregations are in a stake. It's just Mormon terminology. But I made friends with these girls who went to my middle school but who were also in my stake and who I knew were Mormon. And these girls were pretty mean to me. <laughs> they were rude. They were judgmental. They would call me fat. They would, you know, say I was ugly, that I didn't do my makeup right. And I was really trying to be friends with them because I didn't have any friends having just moved to the area. And I felt like if anyone is going to be my friend, it's going to be these Mormons because I'm Mormon and they're Mormon. So they're going to be nice to me, right? <laughs> The answer is no, they weren't. And I found myself to be pretty unhappy with them. And we did some sleepovers and they did this pinching game where they were pinching me and while I was trying to sleep. And I just, I ended up just feeling like I'm not going to be friends with these Mormon girls anymore. They're not good friends. <laughs> and instead I had this art class because I've always loved art. And there were these other girls in this art class who uh, I just really got along with really well and they were funny and they were strange and they honestly were I think what a lot of people would consider like the druggy kids the artsy kids the skater kids I definitely some of them would occasionally smoke cigarettes around me though I never would and I was almost like the Mormon token friend that was like bringing the positive energy and they were so nice to me and so loving and they welcomed me very easily and I I, I honestly went from this Mormon experience of friendship where these good kids were so mean to me 
to this uh, other group of friends where these skater druggie kids were so nice to me and so welcoming and they thought I was cool. And so I, you know, I started hanging out with this friend group more, but I knew my parents wouldn't like it because of obviously what I've said. And so I kept it kind of a secret. And one day, one of these friends asked if I wanted to skip class. So I did. And it was not even the whole school day. It was just class. And we didn't even leave the campus. This was in sixth grade. We just went and sat in the library. As far as bad things your kids can do, skipping a single class and sitting in a library probably is like, hey, don't do that again, but it's probably not cause for a total meltdown. But I feel like my family kind of had a total meltdown. They also find, found out I made a MySpace, uh, which was a big no-no in my family. So uh, after that, my mom basically grounded me for several months. I was told I should not ever speak to those friends again. And the entire experience of having my parents be so disappointed in me made me ask to be homeschooled so I I said hey I don't want to I don't I don't even want to go to school anymore I had this experience with my Mormon friends this experience with these other kids where they led me astray and I just asked to be homeschooled so I was homeschooled for about a year um from about seventh to eighth grade and and I kind of and homeschooling was not very good I don't feel like I learned very much when I went back to school halfway through eighth grade my math teacher asked if I had learned any math while I was homeschooled so I you know I don't think that that was the best thing that could have happened to my education but that was in large part a, a choice I made as a result of wanting to just be the best Mormon I could be and feeling like I had really gone astray by making friends with those kids and I just didn't want to talk to anyone after that I literally started eating my uh, lunch in the bathroom during eighth grade because I just didn't want to interact with people after that. And I became pretty much closed off to a lot of friendship opportunities because I think I was already pre, I was already predisposed to be shy, but then having this experience and feeling like these friendships are not working for me. And all, all I wanted to do was be a good Mormon kid. And all I wanted to do was make God proud of me. And it almost felt like after the homeschool experience, the best way to do that was to just kind of cut off my opportunity to have friends, at least at middle school. Once I changed schools up and I went up to high school though, I really leaned into the whole Mormon thing. I did finally find a good group of friends on the cross country team. And I, after that, became such a little missionary. I was gonna go to BYU, that was my dream. I would, I always had a copy of the Book of Mormon in my backpack. I gave it to, I swear, every one of my friends on the cross country team, I was, just so passionate about being Mormon. And it really felt like in a lot of ways that anywhere in life where I felt indecision, if, if I just brought myself back to trying to be as Mormon as possible, I felt a lot of security there. And so I always really tried to just be as Mormon as possible. And it made me feel like I'm a good person if I give out these book of, copies of the Book of Mormon. I'm a good person if I'm praying as much as I can, reading my personal scripture study. And it felt like a way to guarantee my moral safety. Um, and anytime I, like I've said, had an opportunity to look outside of that, I always wanted to return back to the mo most Mormon part of me possible. Some time passed and in my sophomore to junior year, we moved from Texas to Kentucky. And in Kentucky, I f met with, and in Kentucky, I fell back in with the cross country kids there. Those were always my sure friends that I could guarantee I could get in the friend group with. And uh, I started doing my same thing, giving out copies of the Book of Mormon. There were even people who would know I was Mormon in that high school before they would know my name. So pumped up about being Mormon that I, my nickname was the Mormon girl. Uh, so a lot of people would know me by Mormon girl before they would know me as Alyssa. And I loved that. I just loved it. And I had, I had all of these small opportunities, I feel like come up while I was in high school that every time they would come up, I would pivot to just being centered in Mormonism rather than other passions. I loved to read. I loved to write. I loved painting. I, st I still love those things. 
I love photography. And any time I would would kind of delve into these hobbies, I would often return just back to Mormonism. And running was really the only thing that I did consistently. And when it was my senior year, I started really thinking about what I was going to do for college. And I had all these passions, you know, I got offered a scholarship to go run for a school. I decided to turn it down though, because I wanted to go to BYU and it was not fast enough for BYU. And I think I just turned down a lot of opportunities purely because I just wanted to do what the best Mormon thing to do was. And my dad gave me a blessing my senior year of high school, which is very common. A blessing is where you put your hands on someone's head and he put his hands on my head and he blessed me that I was going to be a teacher, an English teacher as my career. My first year at BYU, I put that as my pre-major My first month, I went in and certified that that's what I was going to major in, and I never wavered from that. And that is, you know, that to me is one of the things I regret the most about my Mormonism is it really set me on a career path that even after I left the church, I was still kind of forced to be on because that's what my degree is in. That's what my experience is in. That's where I can make the most money, earning potential. And so... um, I'll get into that in a bit, but basically I allowed this blessing from my dad to make a major life decision for me without really considering it that deeply for myself. As I said, I really am an introvert. I really feel like talking to other people and being around large groups of other people can be pretty tiring for me. And that is the exact opposite personality of someone who's a teacher. As a teacher, you're in a classroom with 30 kids. And not only are you in that classroom, you're in that classroom for eight to nine hours a day. So I, anyways, I, my dad gave me that blessing and I never once wavered. I never once thought, maybe I should try something else. I was, you know, I was gonna do the thing that I had in my blessing from my dad. I went to BYU and I enjoyed BYU. I had a lot of friends at BYU. I did really like finally having some level of freedom. I had a pretty strict curfew in high school. And so being at BYU was the first time I ever could make a decision for myself and not have a parent, you know, saying yes or no or, or that kind of a thing. So I did enjoy the newfound freedom at BYU. I did think a lot of the rules were kind of funny, but I, I as a Mormon, I was so primed for rules. I was fine with it. So at BYU, you know, you can't, when I was there, there can be no boys in your uh, dorm past 11. I think now it's 12. And so somebody comes around at 11 and just kicks all the boys out. And there was a girl who had a boy in her dorm and she got reported. There's something called the honor code office and she was put on probation And, you know, there was a lot of there's so many rules there. And if you go a walk around campus, it might just feel like a normal university. But I've had friends who had to go to the honor code office. And it's a scary, scary place. From what I understand, they grill you. They ask who's involved. I had another friend who uh, some of his he was dating a girl and some of these girls roommates reported her to the honor code office for being a lesbian. Yes. And they had her boyfriend come in and have to testify that she wasn't a lesbian, (laughs) which it's not like uh, Mormon kids have sex. So he couldn't just say, yeah, she's not a lesbian because, you know, we have sex all the time. But he literally just had to say she's really girly. Uh, You know, she's never said anything about liking women to me before. And this whole experience, that's just one of thousands of honor code office stories where people go and have these incredibly strange experiences. And if you've ever been to the honor code office, please type in the comments because these stories are wild and they really will take your degree from you. They will kick you out of the university. They don't care if you're three or four years into a degree. Uh, I had a friend who had her degree taken or, uh, I had a friend who they banned her from from receiving her degree when she was a month away from graduation because she had chosen to leave the church. So anyways, BYU is kind of wild, but because I was always such a good Mormon kid and I was very much into rule following, I never had any problems like that because I 
would unquestioningly do anything any Mormon leader ever asked me to do. I, I, and I never even went to a party with alcohol. I had never even seen alcohol really, except for at my grandparents' house who weren't Mormon. And so I'm at BYU. I'm working hard to get my teaching degree and they actually changed the missionary age while I was there. So it used to be that girls could only go when they were 21 and they changed it to be 19. And so they called it the wave because all of these girls suddenly up and declared they were going on missions and I was one of them. And I was not permitted to go on a mission as quickly as I wanted to because I had this issue with mental health. I've always had a very bad depression, especially growing up. It's not as bad now as, as it's not as bad now that I'm adult, but growing up, it was very bad. And so my bishop said I had to be cleared by a psychologist before I could go on my mission. And this really made me upset because I ended up having to wait about a year to uh, go on my mission. And during that time, I was in the temple. And this is one of a few experiences that I'll share. I kind of talked about a little bit about the teaching decision. Um, but this was another experience that I had that really made me start to question. So I was sitting in the temple waiting to do baptisms for the dead. And if you don't know what baptisms for the dead are, you can go watch a video about it on my page. And while I was waiting, and keep in mind, you're told that the temple is the house of the Lord. That's the house of God. And there is literally nowhere <laughs> in the world that is more holy than the temple. See for revelation in the temple, uh, that is feels like unquestionable, right? If I get a powerful revelation in the temple, I, as a Mormon, am going to say there's, this is, this is really important because I received this message from God or what I perceived to be a message from God in the temple. And while I was sitting there and I hadn't even been thinking about it or really praying about it, I just got this feeling that I was going to go on my mission to somewhere in Italy. And the feeling was so strong. It made me cry. I was brought to tears by this feeling. And I felt like because I had wanted to wait to serve a mission till I was ready, God was blessing me to, to know this information before my mission call ever even came. And so I went home and I wrote in my journal, I know that God will call me on a mission to Italy as sure as I know God lives because the feeling was that strong. And it was the same feeling that I had used to say, Joseph Smith's a prophet, the same feeling in my heart I had used to say, God is real. And it felt like this powerful feeling I'm having in my body is telling me objective truth and I'm going to serve a mission in Italy. And so time passes, I finally get my mission call. It comes in an envelope and I wanted to read it in a special place. So I went on a little hike. I hiked to the top of the Provo Mountain, the Y Mountain with the Y on it. And I opened the mission call. And I even remember, and I even remember thinking as I was walking up that this is all, this is just for show. Like I, I already know what it's going to say. Cause usually the letter says what date you're reporting for your mission and where you're going to go. So I'm walking up the mountain, just like, I'm so sure, you know, what this is going to say. And then when I sit down on my rock, I open it up, I read it, and it says, I'm going to Denver, Colorado. If you consult a map, you'll see that Denver is quite different and far away from Italy. And I just, I almost dropped it. And I looked up and looked around almost like, is, is someone here that I can talk to, uh, to about this? I think they sent me the wrong letter because I was so sure. I was so sure that I was going to Italy. And I started walking back down the mountain. And I swear by the time I was at the bottom of that mountain, I just had completely convinced myself that I must have been making it up. And it was all a lie. And I misinterpreted. And why would God speak to me? even though he spoke to, you know, all these people in the scriptures and Joseph Smith and all these other men who are apostles and all these people who get revelation. And that's true, but mine wasn't. And so just like I had so many times before, instead of saying, hmm, I think maybe they're wrong and I'm right. I thought I'm wrong. I misinterpreted revelation from God and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go to Denver. I'm excited, I guess. That's where God wants me, obviously. So I'll go there. So I totally cast off any question or doubt based off this experience. And I just decided to 
bury my head in the sand and go to Denver. And all the time I was in Denver, I really thought, why am I here? What happened? That was such a strong feeling. I also, before I served my mission, received my endowment, which I'll show a picture here of what you wear. And if you'd like, I'll also share the picture of what my um, video is about the endowment. I want to make a new one because I, I made it before I had this nicer equipment. So it's maybe a slightly less pleasing to watch. But if you want to hear an explanation, you can go watch that video. And I, I just hated it. I felt like I had been lied to. I felt like the truth had been concealed from me. While it was happening, you know, you bow your head and you covenant and promise to give everything you'll ever have to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormon Church. You uh, go in a prayer circle. You have to you get these handshakes. Different people are embracing you uh, through a veil. You have to give this secret long code that's this prayer basically that's about your posterity and it, it was just also very strange and it felt not representative of, at all like growing up it just feels like you're mormon you're in a small but still mainstream christian denomination i go to church i take the sacrament i got baptized everything within the mormon church felt similar enough to my friends who were just Christian that it, it felt like I'm just in a different church and my church has the whole truth. Their church has a lot of the truth, but someday they'll be Mormon, you know, and it just still felt like I'm just in a normal church. While I was on my mission, I was a pretty good missionary, I think. I helped baptize about 25 people, which was good for the area where I was serving. I was made a leader, a sister training leader is what they call it, uh, within maybe six months of me being out there. And, uh, you know, I was all, I really gave it my best. I worked really hard. Uh, I very much regret spending a year and a half of my life doing unpaid labor and paying to do this unpaid service for the church, which is basically just doing sales for the Mormon church for a year and a half for free. <laughs> and during that time, I had a really hard time with some of the rules. Like you're not allowed to talk to your family, or at least you weren't when I went. Uh, you can only call them twice a year. And that was really hard because it felt like I was completely disconnected from my family. I also had a very hard time with the rule that you have to be with your companion 24 seven it's called sight and sound. So even if I'm in this room and my companion is on the other side of that door back there, that's called disobedient. That's called breaking the rules. So uh, I, I had a hard time being with someone all the time, especially because I was made to wait to serve a mission for a year. And I had a lot of mission companions with a lot of emotional issues and a lot of things that they would be awake at night crying or um, ha just just things that I felt like they they would say, you know, I'm depressed. I've been depressed my whole life. And they weren't kept from a mission or made to make sure that they would be OK prior to serving a mission. Um, and so not that I was frustrated at them having that issue because everyone has issues, but it felt like I had waited this whole time to be mentally well and these other people who I now was kind of responsible for because they were having a very hard time weren't made to wait. And like I said, I spent some of that time really thinking about why I was not in Italy. And also on my mission, I had a, a similar experience. There are three main experiences that kind of led me down this path of questioning my faith. The next was I had been dating someone prior to serving a mission and I felt like I was thinking about this person a lot and as a missionary you're supposed to forget yourself and go to work. You're not supposed to be thinking about yourself uh, which is another way they manipulate you into not questioning or wondering I'm really unhappy. Is that because I shouldn't be here? <laughs> if you say that you're told forget yourself and go to work which is code for uh, you know the cult needs you so can you stop having emotions. <laughs> so um, I was struggling with this this person that I was like, should I keep writing them? Should I just forget about it for the rest of my mission? And I was praying. And similarly to the temple, I felt like as I was praying and as I was questioning and as I was thinking, I was a missionary. And so just like the temple is the holiest place on earth, here I am as a missionary giving 
every single moment of my day to going out and trying to spread the Mormon gospel. So I think I, if I have a revelation, it's probably a pretty good revelation here on my mission when I am doing everything in, in my power to convert people to God's gospel. So I got this really powerful feeling similarly to when I got a powerful feeling about going on my mission to Italy, uh, that I was going to marry this guy and that this is that I should keep, you know, going on with this experience. I should keep writing him. I should keep thinking about him because this is my eternal companion who I'm going to marry in the temple. And so it's very worthwhile to keep investing in this relationship. And so I had a really powerful feeling during a prayer that I would marry this person. Spoiler warning, I met my husband after my mission. So when I got home from my mission, this person didn't didn't want to date me anymore uh, and went off. So I, it, it was another experience where I had really felt like in my heart, like th- I know that this is true as truly as I know all these other gospel principles, because the, the feeling that I had that led me to this truth, the same feeling I've used to learn the truth of the Book of Mormon, God, Jesus, Joseph Smith, it's all the same spiritual feeling. And so it felt like this was the second time that I had very much made a life plan, a life plan. I'm going to marry this person, a life plan. I'm going to serve a mission for a year and a half. And I'm, I'm using God to help me direct my life. And it's just patently false. You know, maybe you might, (laughs) I, I can't deny the fact that I did not serve a mission in Italy. And I cannot deny the fact that when I got home from my mission, this guy didn't want to date me. And That's two counts of times God told me something would happen, and then it didn't. Some people will say, God doesn't tell you things that happen. That's not the way revelation works. Okay, I can go online right away and find many instances of conference talks and scriptures where God tells the future. God says, this is going to happen uh, in scripture, in conference talks, in stories told from the pulpit, And so, you know, honestly, um, I feel like when people try to discredit this revelation I had uh, and say, well, God was just trying to teach you something. God was just it's all it's all just mental gymnastics. There's always a logical way to weasel your way out of objective truth through spiritual experience. So if if I say, oh, I thought this was going to happen and then it didn't. Well, guess what? The the real answer is God is testing you. Uh, The the real answer can't ever be God isn't real. The real answer will always be he was testing you. He was trying to teach you a lesson. Uh, It won't happen till later. Maybe when you're a senior missionary, that's when you're supposed to serve your mission in Italy, when you're 50 or 60. No matter how you tell your story, no matter how you say, hey, I had this experience. It really made me come to the conclusion God isn't real, there's always a Mormon or a religious explanation to get you to double back on your lived reality and to say, well, the reason that that happened was, I even had my mom once say that the reason my dad's blessing wasn't that accurate was because my dad wasn't their divorce now, being very a very good pr- priesthood holder at that time, which to me is like, so I made my whole life decision off a of priesthood blessing and y- The best you can come up with is because my dad wasn't righteous, the blessing was inaccurate. Well, okay, so is that just now the case for every blessing I ever get? I have to wonder, is this guy really worthy to hold the priesthood? Like, you know, no matter what I say, I've had so many people try to kind of say, well, maybe the reason God told you you were going to marry that guy was because he wanted you to learn that human relationships are still important, even if you're on a mission. It's like, okay, so did God lie to me? God can lie. The spirit can lie. I can receive revelation about knowing I'm going to serve a mission in Italy. And then it's pat, it's just false. So that's God lying. Then does God lie just to teach me lessons? That's confusing. <laughs> when I tell these stories, you, I know that the faithful Mormons in the comments are going to say, well, you should have prayed harder. You should have tried harder. It's, it's all just this ploy to get you stay, stay hooked 
in as long as possible because there's never a point when you've done enough research. There's never a point when you've tried hard enough and people say, okay, you did your due diligence, you're good to go. It's always gonna be, you didn't try hard enough. It's always gonna be, you, you didn't pray long enough. The answer will never be, I'm right. That's the problem with religion is like, the, the answer will never be, oh, you tried, you read, you read the scriptures enough and all right, well, yep. Now, you know, your li lived journey, your life, um, that's valid now. <laughs> Leaving the church will never be valid. Uh, I will never, I will never have done enough. People stay in the church for decades because of this narrative that if you're faltering in your faith, you just didn't try hard enough. And so that instead of saying, maybe the reason that this is happening to me is because this church isn't true uh, or God isn't real. Rather, they say, well, maybe the reason this is happening is because I'm not trying hard enough. And so they keep paying their tithing, their 10%. They keep showing up and cleaning the church building for free. They keep opening up that book Joseph Smith wrote in the 1800s and saying, maybe I just need to try harder. And this it's very manipulative because people who struggle people who start saying ah this doesn't seem true to me are are posed as being incredibly weak and l having a poor moral compass and there's a t uh, term coined that was lazy learners uh, that you're just too lazy to give enough to god and that is manipulative because it, even if people have stopped believing for a very long time they still feel like that's on me. I, I don't believe anymore because that was my fault. And that's just inaccurate. I objectively did not go on my mission to Italy. And most people who were not raised in a very intense religious environment would have that experience and say, hmm, maybe it's because God isn't actually speaking to me. Maybe it's because I'm just a human being on a rock in space and there is no heavenly father with 10 toes and 10 fingers somewhere worrying about me and where I'm going to serve my mission or how to find my car keys. Um, but us Mormons are trained to think, no, I'm wrong. I don't have the ability to receive revelation and the way prophets do. I needed to learn, learn a lesson. I wasn't valiant enough. All of these things are used against us to keep us coming back for more <laughs> as long as possible. After my mission, I found I after my mission, I uh, ended up dating my husband. We got married within maybe a year of meeting each other and about a year of me being home for my mission. So I got home from my mission uh, probably 14 or 15 months later. I'm married, which is very common for Mormons. And uh, I'm still married to the same person. We both left the church at the same time, which I'll talk about in a bit. But I will say that I'm very grateful that I met my husband, uh, even if it was through the church. He also, I think, opened the door for me to think in a different way about the world. His family, his parents, one of them was Mormon, one of them was not. So he was raised by at least 50 percent of his raising was by somebody who wasn't Mormon and wasn't teaching this incredibly high demand religion to him as the only way to exist on the planet. And so I think he just had a more nuanced view of the world. And as we were talking a lot, as we were dating, that really started to help inform my own worldview and how I should potentially just see things differently um, from what uh, I had been presented with as a teenager. One, one example of this from when we were dating is uh, we were talking about how I don't remember how the topic came up, but we were talking about gay people and being gay. And I said, you know, I, I love gay. This is what every good Mormon says. I love gay people. Of course I love gay people. I just don't want them to get married. Uh, and so, you know, they don't see how that's not really that loving to deny that basic right from gay people, even though straight people get to get married. And that's not a question. But I said this you know, I love, I love gay people. I just don't think they should be able to get married. And my husband, who at the time was still very Mormon, he served a Mormon mission. He said, why should your religious beliefs dictate what other people across the country have to do? And I remember being just like, felt, felt like I got slapped in the face because I honestly, 
I had never expected to have to defend this bigoted opinion prior, like to a Mormon, to a member of the church. I grew up in Texas and Kentucky and Montana. I so, you know, it's not like I was unfamiliar with interacting with non-Mormons. And I would have never said to some of my friends in high school, I don't think gay people should be able to get married because I would know that they would disagree with me. And I would just roll my eyes and say, well, they're just disagreeing with me because they're not Mormon and they're not religious enough. But to have a Mormon disagree with me, that was a first. And I remember just tripping over my words, trying to figure out how to defend my argument, which was that gay people shouldn't have rights. And I think though those conversations where he's just kind of gently pushing the boundary of, hey, have you ever considered it this way? And doing it in a very open, loving, you know, he's not trying to start an argument. He's just legitimately asking, doesn't it seem a little messed up that your religious beliefs are being the constraint, are, are, res are restraining other people from, you know, living their lives and having rights that you enjoy without even thinking about. And it was very, um, it was very kind of earth shattering a little bit, honestly, to have a Mormon argue with me about gay rights. And we, that was just one conversation of many that we had where he would just kind of explain something or bring something up in a way that I found difficult to argue against because honestly, it seems true to me. And I also like, for example, too, we had this conversation about how I was very much about, I very much felt like school should be abstinence only. And he said, I think school should teach about how to prevent against teen pregnancy. I think kids should know about contraception. And I was just like, that was another moment that I was like, wait, a Mormon thinks there should be conversations about condoms in school. And I was just, uh, you know, very blown away by that. But then, you know, he's saying kids, people have sex, you know, and even if you don't want them to, even if they've only been trained on an abstinence only curriculum, it's still going to happen. And so don't you think that in case it does and when it does, because statistically it does, that they should know how to prevent pregnancy and STDs. And I found that very hard to argue with. Um, and I uh, that's just another example of him, you know, just testing the waters of, hey, let's think about this, the the way that you have constructed the the moral way to be and the way the world should be and just look at it from a few other perspectives. Um, and so I think that kind of also primed me for what I'm about to talk about next, which is the phase of life where I really started to stop believing in the Mormon church and even stop believing in God. About six months into getting married, I finally fully graduated from college and I began my first year of teaching. And during this year, uh, I realized I hated teaching. And, you know, people have pointed out, well, you're still a teacher because here you are teaching about Mormonism. Yes, this is much different for me than standing in front of in when I taught ninth grade, sometimes my classes were as big as 35 to 40. So that's a lot of kids. And it was my first year. I was still 23. I've always kind of had a little bit of a baby face. I think when I first showed up to, um, my, my first day of school as a teacher, I went to the receptionist and I asked for my class schedule because the first day I was supposed to report and get my finalized class schedule of my students' names and the, the, the bell schedule, basically. And so she looks up at me and says, because I had just asked, what can I have my, my schedule, please? And she asked, what, what grade are you? <laughs> and I was just like, I'm a teacher here and she, of course, was apologetic. But I think, you know, I think that th I didn't really have that going for me because I think a lot of middle schoolers, probably if I looked like I was in my 40s or 50s or 60s, they would just inherently give me more respect. Uh, I think a lot of them saw me as just young and immature and you're just like us. And really, I was pretty close to them in age, much closer to them in age than, uh, you know, the 40 to 50 year old teacher down the hallway. And I was also still pretty immature. I was still learning about teaching. It was my first year. I had just graduated. I was pretty young. And I'm, I'm not here to say 
And I'm not here to say I was the best teacher in the world. I will say, though, my students had really good test scores that year, just as one metric. So I, I think I did do a pretty good job and I worked really hard at it. I've always been a hard worker. But I think as far as just specifically the classroom management goes, I really struggled to get the respect of the students. And I saw and it almost took me back to this experience in middle school where, you know, despite being in Texas, really seeking out Mormon friends because I felt like, OK, I can be friends with Mormons and then having those kids be really mean to me. And when I was a teacher at the school and I've taught other places, too, since then, these kids were very mean to each other. And this was an American fork. And this population was a very high 90 percent plus lives, you know, in American fork. Uh, 90% plus Mormon. And I often you can just tell the Mormon kids because they go to a seminary scripture class, which they learn about the Bible and they look at, learn about the Book of Mormon while at school. Uh, this is a this is Utah specific. They have seminary in school. It's not a credit. Uh, it's basically just part of the school day is spent on this religious class. It's basically treated as an elective. And so the reason I could tell who's Mormon is a lot of the times, well, first kids would talk about it, but also uh, a lot of kids would carry around their scripture case, which I actually have my own scripture case because I was using it in another video. But this is what a Mormon scripture case looks like. And you can always tell it's a Mormon scripture case because... Uh, this is what the Mormon scriptures look like. So if I showed you this, you'd say that looks way too thick to be the Bible. That's because this is the Bible, the Book of Mormon and the Pearl of Great Price and Doctrine and Covenants. So that's my scriptures. So anyways, all the kids would be carrying these around at school every day. Very heavy uh, because they'd be going to seminary. So I, I could it was always pretty easy to pick out the Mormon kids. And it was most of the kids were Mormon. But I, they were just all honestly very awful to each other. They were awful to me. I had one t parent tell me that the reason her son didn't respect me was because I was a woman. And she said this as a matter of fact, not like we're working on it, um, but just you know, basically like he doesn't respect me either because I'm his mommy. Uh, you know, you know, boys, you know, men, they don't respect women. And it, it, I just remember feeling like you're not going to you're not going to do anything about that for your son. You're just going to let that be OK. I also early on in the year was trying to be a good teacher. I wouldn't let the kids have their phones. They didn't like that. And then uh, but also I decided to have us read this one book about Emmett Till. If you don't know the story of Emmett Till, he was lynched and murdered and killed in the 1950s after a white woman said that he whistled at her, which later the white woman said she lied about. And she told her husband, her husband got some horrible men together and they did this to this 14 year old. And we read a book called Getting Away With Murder uh, in my classroom, which was on the approved list. And we talked about racism and we talked about why this might have happened and I remember so many of the kids just treating it like it was a joke and uh at one point walking over to a picture at one point we did something called a gallery walk where all the kids walk around and look at different pictures they basically are looking at historical artifacts and they're supposed to just write their thoughts on a sticky note it's kind of like a pre-read activity for kids to start asking questions and thinking about the text and I decided to have one of the pictures for the chapter we were reading that day be the photo of Emmett Till in the open casket, which his mom decided to do to basically show the world what these men had done to her children, what the men had done to her child. And this choice to make it open casket made the story of his murder international news and really had its, its intended effect, which was to make people care and to make people look and to make people think about what's happening in this part of the world. And so I decided to have this picture as part of the walkthrough because it was in the book, which was approved. And also because I felt that it was important to kind of honor Emmett Till's mother in that way by sharing this part of the story with the students. And I recall that some of the kids in a few of the classes wrote just heartless things on their sticky notes uh, to post next to the picture. So one kid said, ha ha. Another kid wrote a smiley face and another kid wrote something like he looks like a hamburger, um, which are obviously all 
um, horrible things to say and very careless. And I remember just thinking how heartless it was that this was their reaction. And also knowing that growing up as a Mormon kid, you hear about the death and the murder of Joseph Smith constantly. Uh, he was this it's phrased as this like martyr experience. And you watch these videos about it, about how he was killed when he was imprisoned. And I remember thinking that there's no way that these kids act this way when the, the death of Joseph Smith, the story is recounted. When, when they hear that story, they are, they're respectful, I'm sure. Uh, and they're quiet and they're um, reverent and they treat it with, you know, respect and a level of, you know, sacredness. And it, I just knew that that was how they, because I was a Mormon kid. And I knew that they had the, I knew that growing up, they definitely had the potential and the ability to be respectful about death and that they were choosing not to. And it was because this specific instance was something that they didn't care about. Um, and I truly felt like it was because it was a black kid. And I also think at the time with these instances of them, of these students being kind of heartless, feeling like, I don't think 14 year olds, basically feeling like this was a manifestation of their parents and the culture that they were raised in and where they came from. I think that in many ways it was evidence of how they had been taught to move through the world as a result of being raised in a Mormon society and in a Mormon culture. And not that that is what ruined my testimony, but just was another kind of nail in the coffin of feeling like even from my experience at middle school where these Mormon girls were mean to me and having these uh, kind of throughout growing up in the church, having Mormons maybe feel like they're, they're rude or they're mean or they're judgmental or they're cool or they don't, they don't, they're not kind in the way I see other people be kind. And then seeing these other Mormon kids where there's 90% Mormon population and just seeing such a lack of empathy and such a lack of caring. And also knowing the church does have a very extensive history of racism and seeing these kids just not care or value or honor this very horrible story that's meant to, you know, Emmett Till was 14, the kids are 14, that's meant to really help them build a level of empathy and understanding that surpasses race that, hey, we care about this happening to this boy because he was he was like us. He was one of us and he was killed because of this reason that is so inhuman and cruel and awful. I also had students uh, I also had students who would just kind of mess with me throughout the day. Um, at one point, I I would have students who I would usually at the beginning of class do five or six minutes of independent reading just as everyone's settling in and still some students are coming in from the hallway and they would wait for me to be doing this independent reading and they would can't come and slam on the door um, and I would always jump, you know, and, and basically they would film this happening and put it on Snapchat. So uh, they would film me reacting through the door and then they would put it on Snapchat as like a ha ha, you know, look at Miss Grenfell, the teacher. She's, you know, we're, we're making fun of her. And the same group of kids at one point bought, I guess you could buy these at Hot Topic or something. It's like a little smoke bomb. And at the end of the passing period, they rolled it under my door. And so I'm just, you know, wrapping up the class and I look back and the whole back of the classroom is filled with smoke and it's also it's like a stink bomb so it smokes and it also smells awful and they literally had to evacuate half the school because there was smoke and someone pulled the smoke the fire alarm and everybody went outside I guess it was probably the whole school because it was fire alarm um, but everybody's streaming outside and like what's going on what's going on and I'm like it's because they literally just rolled a smoke bomb stink bomb under my door throughout that school year my depression really came back I was having such an awful time going in and kind of facing these experiences every day of the kids being super rude to me. The leadership didn't really care at all. When I tried to get help, they just said, it's your first year, you know, these are opportunities for you to figure it out. And I just honestly really struggled and had a, a and I would have panic attacks before going to school. And 
I will say I know lots of people are teachers. I'm not proud of the fact that this made me have panic attacks. I would love to have be able to say, oh, it was r as right as rain and I had no problem with it. And those those darn kids, you know, but it really it really was taking a toll on my mental health. And I hit the point where I was kind of getting to be a little suicidal, honestly, um, <clears throat> which I'm not proud of. I, I wish, like I said, I wish I was stronger than that. But I think just going into school every day and having these conversations and trying to teach and having the kids be rude to me, I would have them, they would leave me awful notes. And, you know, I just kind of, I just had a bad time of it. And I remember maybe a few months in just realizing, you know, the reason I chose this career path is because I had that blessing from my dad and I've never really questioned. I never really did a lot of soul searching to think, you know, do I have the, do I have the, the personality to be a teacher? Am I great around large groups of people? Do I love talking loudly? I, every year of teaching, I always end up losing my voice because I have really weak vocal cords, I guess. So I remember having all of these issues kind of culminating and starting to really question, you know, what I was even doing, why, why I was teaching and feeling like, <clears throat> and feeling like I had really only chosen it because my dad's blessing and that I could have right now have done art. I could have been a writer. I could have done so many other things. And even if those career paths honestly had gone poorly, at least I would have known I really chose it for myself and that I hadn't just completely outsourced my decision making to this blessing to God and never questioned once because if there was one thing I was sure of, it was a commandment from God. And I sat in my car one day after having just a really one of these really bad days at school and feeling like it's not a good fit. I'm not cut out for this. I shouldn't be doing this and feeling like, you know, every time I had kind of questioned if this like what was going on in my life and just had thought if I'm not feeling like this is a match, it's because I'm not good enough or I'm not trying hard enough or I'm not working hard enough. And finally allowing myself to just say, maybe God isn't speaking to me. Maybe God isn't real at all. Maybe the blessing was just my dad talking. Maybe these feelings I felt have just been my own emotions pushing me toward a desired outcome. And I remember just really being like, wow, I, for the first time at 23, I'm allowing myself to ask, is, is it, is it because God isn't real? <laughs> is it because revelation isn't real? Is it because my church isn't this thing God put on the earth? And I just, you know, my brain exploded a little bit. Um, and <clears throat> it was very, it was very difficult. And it really, as soon as I started having these doubts, I uh, brought it to my husband and I said, hey, you know, I, I'm having these questions. I'm starting to feel like all of these decisions I've made or all of these revelations I've had in my life, maybe they were just me hoping for things. And maybe, you know, the church isn't, what it what it proclaims to be and we and he was very loving he was very kind about it he's very thoughtful I feel like I'm lucky I, I've had friends who come to their husbands with the same feeling and their husbands say hey if you leave the church I'm gonna divorce you uh, I want to be with someone in the church and so I'm lucky enough to have somebody who was willing to just say hey I'm gonna be here to support you I love you you know I, I'm on your team. And he at the time said, I want to keep attending. I want to keep going to church. I still believe, um, but I support you uh, on your journey on what you feel like is best. And we had recently moved to a new ward because we changed apartments. And so I, I kind of stopped going to church for a little bit. I would stay home and I would switch between reading my scriptures and praying and hoping to feel, you know, because losing losing your religion, losing God is almost like experiencing death. Like the most important aspect of your personality starts to disintegrate. It's very terrifying. And I really had to start to question and ask what, what even is next? What do I do? If I, do I tell my family? Do I hide? Do I lie? Where, like almost who am I without Mormonism? And 
my husband also was at the time attending a class at BYU, which was meant to teach people about early church history, which growing up, you don't hear about, about Joseph Smith's polygamy, about black people not receiving the priesthood or temple ordinances. There's a big long list of things that when people discover, you can read about it in something called the CES letter. It's basically a list of once people find out these things are true, they really start to question the church because the church doesn't teach about Joseph Smith having 30 plus wives. The church doesn't teach about the problems of the Book of Mormon and how people have kind of been able to prove it's just a made up thing that Joseph Smith wrote. And so so this class at BYU is almost it's basically Jackson, my husband, called it Defense Against the Dark Arts because it's hoping to help you understand some of these less favorable parts of the church. And they use the word inoculate enough. And they use the word inoculate. They're basically trying to inoculate you against uh, having anti-Mormon literature win you over because they're like, if if we can teach these things from the church's past in a very faith-based, faithful way, maybe we can keep the hemorrhage from happening. Maybe we can have more people say, I have a nuanced view. I know about Joseph Smith's polygamy, but because I learned about it from a faith-based source, I'm able to kind of mentally gymnastics my way out of losing my testimony because I can understand the apologetic version, essentially, of why these things happened. And so as I'm kind of losing my testimony based off of these personal experiences I had recently had and had throughout my life, my husband is learning and coming home and talking through with me about the history uh, of the church and a lot of the unfavorable things that are the reason many people leave. And so I think previous to having this spiritual experience where I started to question God and question my ability to truly literally receive personal revelation, I was also... I I had always looked past church history because I said, okay, I had this faithful feeling. I had this personal feeling. I had personal revelation that the Book of Mormon is true, that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. And so I was able to dismiss all of church history because of this feeling I had had. I had a testimony based off of feelings and I had a testimony based off of what I perceived to be personal revelation. And so once that began to be swept away, It opened the door for me to finally really look at church history with a objective critical eye. And so I began reading with Jackson. We read the CES letter. We read all of these other books, Rough Stone Rolling, No Man Knows My History. You know, we're just spending a lot of time digging through what I had always kind of ignored or put in the back of my mind as that that doesn't matter as long as Joseph Smith's a prophet it doesn't matter if what he did wrong because God told me Joseph Smith is a prophet. And so, and so losing, losing my belief in personal revelation is really what allowed me to finally open my mind to all of the unfavorable history that was always waiting that, you know, that was always there, but I hadn't been willing to look at it and really process it and really think about it from a, an open way. I would say maybe three or four months passed this way where I I wasn't really attending church. I was still questioning and I I wasn't a hundred percent yet though. I, I, I still was going back and forth pendulum. It was like, I was like a pendulum going back and forth between I'm wrong. The church is right. God is real. The book of Mormon is true. Joseph Smith was a prophet of God to, you know, an hour later being like, it's all false. It's all fake. None of it's real. It's all made up. It's all contrived. A man-made religion meant to get me to act a certain way. And I would just go back and forth between these two feelings. And finally, one Sunday, I decided to go back to church because I felt like maybe, maybe I'm just going to give, I'm going to try again. You know, maybe I'm being a lazy learner. Maybe I'm not trying hard enough. Maybe I'll, I'm just going to go give it another try. And so while I was in church, I was in sacrament meeting and I just felt awful. I just felt so gross. I felt like even me being here is a lie. I don't believe this. I just don't believe it. And I was basically sick to my stomach and I go through sacrament meeting. I didn't take the sacrament. And at that point, Jackson was really questioning his faith 
his testimony too. And he didn't take the sacrament. And we go to Sunday school. I'm pretty quiet. And in the third hour, which is women only, it's called Relief Society. I was sitting there and uh, the woman said that the person who was supposed to give the lesson for that day uh, wasn't there. They had to leave. And so we're instead of having a formal lesson with the lesson manual, we're just going to bear our testimonies of Joseph Smith. And I found that so ironic because, you know, here's me having spent the last few months reading about Joseph Smith's tre treasure digging and all of the times he tried to fraud people and him trying to get control of gov local town governments wherever he went and his polygamy and the 14 year olds and marrying the wives of other men. And here we are all meant to bear testimony of how Jesus, uh, Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. And so I kind of sat there while everyone starts standing up, bearing their testimony. A testimony is maybe like a one minute to two minute speech about what you believe. So people were saying, you know, I, I know Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. There's a quote about how no man has done more for the earth or the planet except for Jesus. Uh, Joseph Smith was the second most important man that's ever walked on the face of the earth. And someone read the lyrics to praise to the man which is about how, you know, earth shall atone for the blood of that man. And it's very hero worshipy. Some people say the song is even just normal worship, basically treating Joseph Smith as another god almost because he was so important and so holy. Um, and so everyone's standing up and I just got so frustrated because I felt like there's so much about Joseph Smith that either none of you know or none of you are choosing to include in your testimonies about all of this unfavorable stuff and yet we're going to sit here and talk about this man for a good hour without even mentioning most of the things that he did <laughs> uh, most of the important things most of the truth we're just all regurgitating back and forth this whitewashed version of who joseph smith was and as I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, you know, on my mission, I told so many investigators that a testimony is found in the burying of it. And maybe if I bear my testimony right now, I will have some sort of revelation. I will have some sort of spiritual experience that will help me that will help me get back to, you know, whatever truth that I once felt. And so I stand up and I basically say, I'd like to bear my testimony that I know that Joseph Smith was a prophet and that even though he, you know, people say he didn't necessarily translate the Book of Mormon from an ancient gold plate record. And even though he married the wives of other men, and even though he was uh, convinced a 14 year old to marry him, you know, I at one point felt in my heart, I felt a feeling that told me he was a prophet. And, you know, maybe so since I felt that feeling once, Maybe it's still true because I had a feeling about it. And so maybe, and so I, you know, I'd like to bear my testimony that I do still believe Joseph Smith is a prophet. And I sat back down and just, I felt so gross. And because, you know, I still feel like, I just felt like I had lied. I didn't find a testimony in the bearing of it. I just felt like I'd still lied. And I look around me and everyone's just staring at me like, I had obviously broken the, the code. I broke the Mormon code because even though I had been invited to bear testimony, there is a very strict rule book and guideline about what that testimony can and should not uh, include. And I sat there for a few more minutes right after I was shared the Relief Society president stood up and she just gave the most impassioned testimony and it had all the right things she said all the good things about Joseph Smith, all the things that you're supposed to say as an active member about Joseph Smith. And for me, I just sat there and after a few minutes, I walked out and no one followed me. And, you know, maybe it was a new ward. I didn't know a lot of people there, but I think part of me hoped that someone would follow me and even just ask hey, are you, you know, are you okay? You're obviously leaving the meeting. And they might've just thought I was going to the bathroom, but I think I probably looked pretty upset. And I, I had just said this proclamation to the whole room, but I honestly think once Mormons believe you have anti-Mormon material 
running through your brain, you're no longer really, f- you're not on the same level anymore. You're not fellowshipped in the same way. At least I, nobody followed me, you know, minutes after saying all of that and looking upset, nobody is coming out <laughs> to try to come, you know, hey, that was a lot back there of that testimony. Do you want to talk about it? No. Yeah, nobody. So I just sat in the car uh, till my husband was done with priesthood. And that was the last time I ever attended a Mormon church service. And that was about, you know, seven or eight years ago. I feel like I really tried. Um, And mourning the loss of this was not just the loss of a religion, but, you know, my family has been Mormon for over 100 years. It's back to Joseph Smith. And in many ways, I knew that by losing my testimony, by no longer believing, I was breaking tradition on a hundred plus year family family uh, link, family lineage, um, and that I was also losing my cultural community. I was losing my friends. After I left, I told my mom. Um, I actually kind of halfway told a truth and halfway told a lie because I felt like she wasn't going to be able to handle just the telling you right away and walk away. Um, that would be too much. So I felt, I felt like she really needed to see me struggle with this, with this. I struggle with my testimony. Um, so I, I, after I had already decided that I didn't believe, and I knew I didn't believe after even attending church that day, I told my mom, I, I revealed to her basically for the first time that I was struggling with my testimony, struggling. Um, and I basically for six months, even though I knew I no longer believed, I kind of allowed her to see almost acting it out the process to her of losing my testimony because I felt like she needed to see me struggle. She needed time to try to save me (laughs) and she needed time to, you know, emotionally process the fact that this was happening. And so by the time I already had chose to leave, I started this process with her and started the process with my parents. And I will say my dad was pretty, um, my dad has had an easier time with it because he comes from a part member family. Some of his parents were somewhat Mormon growing up. He didn't get baptized till he was 17 or 18. And so like my husband, he had a more, I think, nuanced view of Mormonism. Whereas on on my mom's side, they're all, they were all very Mormon, her whole family, very, very devout going back a very long way. So I also knew that I was kind of not only letting her down, but also in many ways, putting a black mark on my family because I was going to be another check mark of someone who didn't keep the faith and hold the line strong. I will also say my sister left the church about a year or a year, six months before me. And so she really um, laid the the groundwork, I think, for my parents seeing this happen and coming to terms with it. And so shout out to her uh, for kind of making the way easier. And then as I was leaving, helping me adjust to this process, I will say, too, I actually I didn't tell her the news till after I told my parents, because there's also a very strong narrative that those who leave can corrupt those who are still in. And so I didn't want, I didn't want the narrative at all to be that my sister had corrupted me in the same way that her fiance had corrupted her. And so I chose to just completely say, Hey, I'm going to, uh, I'm not even going to tell her that I'm what I'm going through until I'm totally sure. And until I told my parents. And so, um, I do feel like I, I spent a lot of time in, in those months when I was leaving, trying to figure out how to do it in the most dignified way possible. Because, because when my parent, when my sister had left, people would even come up to me and say, I'm so sorry about your sister. She was, she was tempted away by her fiance. They confused her, you know, they, got their hooks in her and pulled her out. And I even had someone I remember saying to me, Alyssa, I know that will never happen to you because you have such a strong testimony. And then like a year and a half later, I'm, you know, same thing. I got anti or I lost my, I was a lazy learner, lost my testimony too. And so I finally told 
my sister, I told my other, I have three sisters. So I told all of them. I told my parents, uh, initially it was very hard. And I will say I had more than one phone call that ended in just hanging up. Um, but I think once, once everything died down, once the kind of dust had settled, my whole family thankfully has been super loving, super welcoming, super kind. Um, even my mom found out about this whole account and she was, was upset, but also was so, it was so nice and wonderful that I, I guess, honestly, I was worried that if she found out that this whole thing exists, um, she would, um, stop talking to me. Honestly, I was very worried about that. And two months ago, she told me that she knew that this was all here, um, and that I'm posting on the internet about it. And she basically said she wasn't going to let it, you know, get in the way of our family relationship. And so I just feel lucky because even though it was hard, uh, ultimately I have a family who has chosen to love me (laughs) despite this sinful choice that I've made. And, you know, that I don't have to say goodbye to my mom or my dad as a result of choosing to leave the church or write a book about leaving the church or having a YouTube channel, which hopefully will hit a hundred thousand subscribers soon. So that's pretty public. Uh, but you know, my mom has been very loving about it despite the, um, you know, despite, despite the fact that some parents do just stop talking to their kids over stuff like this. So I feel lucky, uh, And I feel grateful that my family is able to see past, you know, this as something that I'm doing. After we decided to leave the church, my husband and I did decide to move out of Utah. Uh, I just found living in Utah to be kind of difficult after leaving the church. If you've ever driven down the I-15, you you really can't escape from the church in Utah. Um, There are temples everywhere. There are chapels everywhere. Everyone basically wears garments, you know, everyone is Mormon. And and th- that's not totally true, obviously, but it, it feels that way. And it definitely felt that way for me, having just freshly left the church. Um, it felt like, you know, it just felt like I wanted to, I just wanted to experience life outside of Mormonism and outside of the the Utah bubble, as they call it. I also, you know, I got my nose pierced, I got my ears pierced, I got my tattoo for my husband and my tattoo for my son. I still need to get my tattoo for my other son coming soon. Um, But I just felt like everywhere I would go, the church, it just felt like the church was in my face a little bit and that it was going to be hard for me to fully walk away from it without leaving. And so we moved to New York, to Brooklyn Uh, and lived there for a couple years. And it really did, it had its desired effect because I mean, Brooklyn felt like the opposite of Provo in many ways. And I, you know, I would meet friends who were atheist or, uh, you know, Buddhist or no religion. I would meet friends who, you know, were non-monogamous and would talk about, you know, why they chose to do that. And I met friends who would drink or smoke, you know, and like, it just felt like for the first time I was just open to whoever it was that was going to walk into my life, um, instead of searching for righteous friends and righteous people to be around. And I remember, too, um, the first few weeks after uh, getting my new job, I was out with coworkers. I got invited to go to drinks with them for like an after work happy hour. And I remember them asking, you know, this is our, probably our first real friend conversation, how I ended up coming to New York. You know, every, most of the people there were transplants but we're from the East coast and had always wanted to live in the city. And so I start talking about how I was Mormon and I left my religion. And so I decided to move and I started talking about the temple endowment and garments and serving a mission. And it's like, as I'm talking more and more people, this is a fairly large group, just fall silent and start listening and just peppering me with questions. And just, I think just even processing like the look on their face, which was very much like, this is, this was your past. And 
the face that was very much like you were raised in a cult <laughs> um w- helped me realize for the first time just how strange mormonism is and i hope that every ex-mormon gets that experience of being outside of utah because even if you leave the church and you're still in utah and you say something like baptisms for the dead no one's no one's going to really react because everyone's so familiar with mormon culture and mormon you know ordinances and and i just feel like truly living in a community of people who have no idea what mormonism is is what's going to help you realize for the first time that the way you were raised is a little weird and that you might need some time to recover from that because i think up to that point i just felt so isolated and insulated within my mormon communities that I hadn't really processed how strange it is to be very Mormon. The fact, and even the fact like telling them at this happy hour that the beer I was holding was my third or fourth beer I'd ever had. And most of these people went to party schools, you know, um, just really, really illustrated for me how much of a different life I had lived. Even the fact that I was already married at 23, most of those people who I met seven six or seven years ago they still aren't married uh you know which i know i'm gonna have in the comments some people saying sounds like the mormons are doing it better okay that's fine well not for me you know uh and not for a lot of people and not for a lot of women either honestly i think you know there's like the whole trad wife movement there's this return back to let's have you know us be like we're in the 50s again well you know I'll say no thank you to that because I would prefer to be an equal to men. I would prefer to have a voice. I would prefer to make choices based off of my own uh, moral compass and my own brain than um, tradition or religion or cultural conservatism. So uh, if you think, you know, you're looking out there for a wife who's going to be a stay at home wife and have your six kids that's great. But I think that everyone should have the choice to do that and shouldn't be raised to believe that that is the only moral way to live. I think also living in New York allowed me for the first time to ask the question, what do I want? What do I I want? Which is a question I had never really allowed myself to ask before. And, And just the question, what do I think of this versus what does God think of this? And I really love the experience of having some something, you know, for example, of having something happen to me, like having someone offer, you know, smoking, not tobacco, but the other thing. And, and just asking, do I want to do that? Is that something I'm interested in? Is what are the risks? What are the rewards? What, what do I truly think of it versus asking, you know, or just saying, no, a good Mormon doesn't do that you know, coffee. Should I drink coffee? Do I want to drink coffee? How does it make me feel? Do I like the benefits? Do I dislike the risks? You know, really uh, investigating a new idea or a new choice or a new opportunity. Do I want to get my ear pierced? And asking myself and just saying yes or no, because it's what I thought, because of me. I, I truly believe that is the most beautiful gift, leaving the church, is getting your own right to choose back and i know yes i'll have mormons in the comments saying you could have always chose you chose to serve a mission you chose to go through the temple but when the choice is between you can either get married civilly and never see your husband in the afterlife or you can get married in the temple and put up with what that's like watch my video if you want to learn more uh and but you'll get to see him in the afterlife and you'll be married for eternity that's not really a choice (laughs) if the choice is either you're a sinful person and you're going, you're not going to go to the celestial kingdom, or you can make this choice by not drinking coffee and live with God again. I, I get that. Yes, of course that is a choice, but you're setting up a false dichotomy of choice where one choice will lead you to absolute happiness and, uh, eternal life. And one choice will leave you to damnation uh, and unhappiness. And so, yes, I know that everyone has a air quote choice, 
But there's a reason why most little eight-year-olds choose to get baptized. That's because it's really not a choice when you're presented with the facts as Mormonism pre presents them. It's either choose heaven or choose damnation in many ways. And so when and so now after having left the church, what I love is that when I make a choice to have coffee or what, whatever the choice may be, instead of thinking, will this choice send me to heaven or hell? I get to think, what are the actual risks and benefits? How do I actually feel about it? And what is what is going on in my brain? And that's what that's what I'll use to make the choice rather than using Mormon morality to make the choice, which is either the Mormons are right objectively all the time. And if you don't agree with them, then you're objectively wrong and you're going and you're not going to go to the celestial kingdom as a result. So I, I, so I, I think after leaving, I really have loved just being able to make the choice for myself. It's also helped me. It's also honestly helped me just not really care at all what other people think. Um, I have a video that did well of my glow up from being Mormon to being ex Mormon. And I had so many, mostly men comment that it was a glow down and you you looked happier as a mormon and i you know i've had a lot of people comment stuff like that and the great great most beautiful thing about leaving the church is that i don't give a fuck about what they say uh and i actually think it's kind of funny you know that but they're just you know i have that video has 11 million views and i still have random men i think there's probably over 10,000 comments i don't know who are who take it upon themselves to go type glow down <laughs> and send it and shout it into the void uh stay angry you know you do you um but it's just so funny to me that people you know will say you got tattoos after leaving you should have stayed mormon because you looked better before i don't care what you think at all you know i had to go through I had to I had to leave the religion and the community of my childhood. I had to face the idea that my mom may disown me, that my dad may disown me. Most of my friends dropped me after I left the church. And so after that experience, I just don't care anymore. You know, I just don't care. Um, and it's it's very freeing to finally just say, you know, I've censored myself for Mormonism. I've said exactly I've 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 thrown out any parts of myself that weren't Mormon enough at at the cost, at the, at the hope of just being a good person. You know, I tried for so long to be what someone else thought I should be that I'm just not doing that anymore. I'm just not going to do it. I, you know, I'm not going to ask, will men think my tattoo looks good? Um, or, you know, or will people on the internet, will I get more likes if I do my hair this way? Or if I don't get this tattoo or this piercing? Or if, you know, I don't care. I just don't care. And it's very freeing. And I hope that everyone who leaves the church feels this way because to finally just say, I don't care what the church thinks. I don't care what my parents think. I don't care what God thinks. He's not real. I don't care at all. I don't care about any people online. It's just so freeing to finally say, instead of being led through my life by any other party, I finally choose to lead myself through my own life. It's my life. I get to choose. And I love it, honestly. And I think it's and I think it's been something that's helped me, you know, start this account, keep posting on this account, even though I get all the angry or judgmental or hateful comments, because I just, you know, I'm just finally here in, at, at 31 years of life telling myself and finally giving myself permission to just say whatever it is I think and letting the cards fall where they will. Sure, I'm going to get things wrong sometimes. Sure, I'm going to make a mistake sometimes. But at the very, very least, I get to have my own mistakes. They are mine. And I would rather have my own mistakes and my own things I did wrong than have everything in my life be given to God and be up to God and be at the, at the best of the Mormon church. You know, I just get to be me now. And it's one of the most freeing, wonderful experiences of my life. After I had my son, I decided not to go back to work. My second son, I decided not to go back to work and I started writing my book and I started posting, you know, TikTok videos about Mormonism and 
a after so many years of just going back to teaching and saying, I'm just going to put up with this for the rest of my life. I finally, with the support of my husband, decided to write the book I'd always dreamed of writing and to talk about this, these issues, which I feel like are really important. And I will say I'm, I'm about to hit a hundred thousand on TikTok and hopefully a hundred thousand on YouTube, 200,000 people somehow, <laughs> you know, are interested in what I have to say, which is a really beautiful and honestly humbling, but kind of wild experience in the last year. And um, I think in many ways I kept being a teacher for all those years because I felt like it was the only thing I would ever be able to do that I would be good at or could make any money at or make a living at. And I decided, you know, one day I sat in the Starbucks and I wrote the introduction to this book and I thought, no one is ever going to read this. Who is going to read a book from me? I'm just some random person. Um, and now I have 200,000 people who follow me online and I've sold, I think I'm probably up to over 2000 copies of this book. Um, and you know, that's amazing. And I put off living my dream, you know, writing, writing specifically writing a book was my dream. Um, I put that off for a really long time because I felt like nobody's going to care what I have to say. And I will say as soon as I decided to stop following teaching the teaching path that my my dad had set me on almost, you know, a decade earlier and commit to writing the book, trying to follow something that I was really, truly, actually passionate about. Um, it's it's succeeded. This whole, this whole thing has been beyond my wildest dreams. And, you know, I... I hope that if anything, it helps inspire other people to just do the thing you really want to do. Um, not to say I did it without sacrifice. I still had to earn money as a teacher for many years before I was able to take the leap into writing this book and making a bet and hoping something would work out and I could switch careers into writing. But now it looks like I actually can. Um, and that's amazing. I'm still almost like in shock when I wake up and see, you know, people, more people have bought the book. I, I wrote every day, I would wake up at 5 a.m. to write that book, you know, and I, I would wake up and I would say, no one's ever going to read this book. And I, nobody cares what I have to say. And what am I doing? I'm wasting my time. And people care. <laughs> people care what I've been through. People care about what other people are going through within the church. Other people are experiencing exactly what I experienced as I left. And I get DMs every day from people saying, thank you for making these videos. Thank you for helping me feel less alone. Thank you for being a voice for people who are like me and who are going through this. And just, you know, follow, say what you say, say how you really feel is what I've taught. Be who you really want to be. Sacrifice what you have to, 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 to get there. Um, and I know this is sounding like a dumb cliche speech at this point, so I'll close there, but I, um, I just am incredibly grateful to anyone who's ever commented on a video, anybody who's ever subscribed or shared anything that I had to say. And I'm going to keep making these videos. I'm planning my book number two, um, which will be a little bit more general and hopefully for anyone who's interested in Mormon topics or Mormon experiences. And I will say after two decades of being raised in the church and feeling like my voice doesn't matter, I've really realized that it does and that my voice is powerful and that human experiences and people being willing to share things that are hard to share is really impactful. And thank you for, for watching. Thank you for caring. Please share this video with anyone who you think might be impacted or who is recovering from Mormonism or is curious about Mormonism. And thank you for watching.